a very good morning to all of you and we warmly welcome uh, everyone for today's cpd program thank you for all of you uh, even though uh, even though we have a very tough situation uh, you all joined for the session uh, the cpd program is has uh, is organized by the government medical officers association and society for health research and innovation our webinar link will be open to you from 9 a.m to 10 15 a.m today each attendee should attend till the end of the webinar to obtain the e-certificate for participation uh, you will be given cpd points according to uh, which are strictly adhered to the nccpd guidelines but apart from those you will be given the e-certificate for participation the link for applying e-certificate will be uh, sent to the chat box at the end of the webinar the chat box will be open to you for your queries and all the questions will be answered at the end of the session also we kindly ask to mute your microphone and switch off your video to avoid any interruption during the session now let me introduce dr himal also the kalambarachi to introduce today's speaker this is over to you sir uh, thank you sashini for the housekeeping messages and uh, introduction uh, good morning everyone uh, i would like to thank all joining with us in this uh, difficult situation around the country as well as the connection issues so that's why we thought of uh, starting this at 9 45 uh, and we will be attending uh, you'll be connecting you to up to 10 uh, 20. Uh, so uh, this session is a second session we are doing with collaboration of in sri lankan society of internal medicine and gmo sri so uh, today our source person is dr lakmal vitanike who is a consultant physician at base hospital udugam and he is not a stranger for southern province he has done quite a lot in uh, last two years while the health sector has in a disastrous condition with COVID. So he was the person who was managing uh, the as a clinical lead in a uh, district general hospital, Hambantota, COVID unit. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Lakmal Vitanage to give his speech regarding the acute heart failure, pathophysiology and its management. And uh, I need to uh, give you some more housekeeping messages before Dr. Lakman starts. There will be a connection issues while we are continuing this talk. And please bear with us. We'll be back in soon. Thank you. Dr. Lakman, so are you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me there? Yes, we can hear you. We can I hear you. All right. Uh, again, good morning to everyone and thank you very much, Himal, uh, for your kind introduction and uh, giving me this opportunity. So, uh, I think uh, since majority is joined now, shall we proceed with the presentation and since it contains little high amount of slides and need some discussion. So, yes, please. I, yes, please. Right. So, so I would like to start my presentation with a uh, case uh, scenario one patient presented to our ET at uh, Udugama and then discuss the uh, each problem that uh, we the way we handle and what is the uh, current guidelines and what are the current uh, evidence to say best management. So with each problem, I will be giving some given you some information uh, about regarding the current and newer therapies as well. So uh, you can uh, keep on update yourself and make uh, uh, give some uh, prepare some questions if you want to answer at the end, right? Okay, this uh, 60 year old patient is a common kind of presentation for vasopressors. So then uh, to build up the uh, blood pressure, and then uh, you can uh, think uh, again. You can use the loop diuretics uh, with the while the pressure is building up because that both we had to use in in hand in hand and with careful monitoring 
because without loop diuretics your lungs get more and more wet and finally difficult to control so while giving a, either anti uh, a good uh, diuresis making a good diuresis you have to keep the blood pressure up and uh, then comes the third step that congestion is relief that congestion relief we expect but we expect is to the pul through pulmonary edema to release the congestion by means of these therapies if not improved we have to consider uh, in the your uh, left side is rrt renal replacement therapy or mechanical circulate support what is available in our setup is uh, renal replacement therapy so we go for the hemo uh, ultra filtration to remove some fluid and or consider palliative care depending on the patient's background is a old age with multiple comorbidities you don't uh, may, may not be escalate to the level of uh, renal replacement therapy which may be detrimental to the him itself so but if congestion is relief yes then you can go for the medical optimization so that is the class one recommendation not to go for advanced other therapies so uh, this algorithm uh, contains a lot of new things and important things for your uh, update uh, knowledge and uh, management in the future the management of some options with the uh, patient with uh, reduced ejection fraction is the top uh, usually what we see is that most of the patients comes to our uh, it use so in the wards for the heart failure having the reduced ejection fraction only few percentage of patients are having other uh, options like uh, other problems like reserve uh, preserved ejection fraction or mildly mildly impaired so this is the order of drugs ACE inhibitor and uh, AR uh, here the again a new drug I will uh, explain to you and then the beta blockers then uh, mineral corticoid receptor agonist and uh, antagonist and uh, dafagliposin, empagliposin, uh, uh, glitazones, uh, the newer drug is SGL2 inhibitors which is a newer group of medication but it's there for some time now and very important to use in the heart failure and loop diuretics for fluid detention and all line the class one recommendation medications uh, is important to know and uh, the drug that uh, we call the uh, uh, ARNI that I will give you a little uh, explanation AR means the again aldosterone receptor uh, uh, blockers you know AR is a, uh, one example is losartan or the telmisartan and uh, NI is a niseritide uh, uh, neprilizing uh, inhibitor. So neprilizing inhibitor is a dra uh, drug uh, that used to block the uh, uh, what is called uh, uh, the uh, natriuretic peptides. Yeah, we talk about BNP, ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, uh, brain natriuretic peptide or natriuretic peptide is broken down by natrilizing uh, enzyme. So what uh, INI is doing, uh, nephrilizing, uh, they block the enzyme called nephrilizing. So then that will cause more prolonged action of the uh, 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 AR, um, a BNP, atrial low brain natriuretic peptide. So that will uh, exert a more prolonged action of sodium and water loss uh, in patient with heart failure. So this is a combined medicine uh, 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 that came, came to the practice in the newer practice. And uh, but still these two, when you have to try with the AC inhibitor first and then failing that or intolerance or poor response, you can go for the uh, ARNI. So that's how it mentioned. So then the beta blocker, uh, MRA, the best example is uh, spinalactone. Uh, is the drug which is available here and uh, uh, the other, then it comes to the uh, there are three other categories if, when you apply in these medications and also i must say about the empagliposin and the empagliposin both uh, the reason there are recent evidence to say because of its action actually it what they taxes by the preventing or impairing the reabsorption of sugar in the renal tubules the simple way that uh, we see the glucose urea when the sugar is high but what this drug makes the same thing but uh, then come lower in the sugar levels in the blood so but same mechanism and the drug causes unexpected 
benefit in the heart failure by losing more sugar, uh, more uh, water with the sugar so this drug has come as a therapy for the not only the patient with heart failure with diabetes even patients uh, heart failure without diabetic so this drug can use be used in patient without even uh, non diabetic patients for the heart failure management is a class 1 recommendation uh, in the newer guidelines so in the the second step uh, is a management approach this is a little bit uh, higher than in our level but just have a look when the heart uh, ejection fraction is less than 35 and uh, when you look at the ecg if the qr is complex with more than 130 that means more than three small squares we call it broad comp but the sorry the uh, left side one is a less than one third that means near normal complexes less ejection fraction less than 35 and where appropriate you can use icd implantable cardio defibrillators because the but this there are some indications as example if the patient having uh, heart failure with the history of some episodes of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation so those kind of patients they have higher chance of sudden death uh, due to arrhythmias either it should be sometimes even it can precipitate bradycardia so to prevent that with uh, one or two evidence of uh, arrhythmias you can go for the icds or if uh, the other cage says that uh, uh, ejection fraction more than 35 or device therapy not indicated or inappropriate uh, then go for the class 2 recommendations like either icd you can use again and uh, but then depend on the uh, uh, other drugs tolerance and outcome so when the sinus rhythm uh, the last one in the right side in the patient with sinus rhythm ejection fraction less than 35 when the complexes are broader we call it uh, bundle branch block with this kind of patients they say cardiac resynchronizing therapy uh, with uh, pacemaker uh, either other option to treat so these are actually now this is done in our uh, setup also there are a trained uh, uh, electrophysiologist in, in even in carapity so when appropriate they can treat for the patients who are selected for these kind of therapies right uh, in this slide here uh, you can see some of the recommendations with the class and level of evidence to so say uh, you can see uh, the first three uh, lines says treatment of hypertension is recommended to prevent or delay onset of heart failure and to prevent heart failure hospitalizations it's very obvious thing and there are level a uh, evidences as well so that means randomized control trial good evidence with meta-analysis so it's no doubt and uh, no need to highlight further and the second line says the treatment uh, with statins again statin treatment to uh, patients high risk of CV or with CV disease in order to prevent delay of onset of heart failure and to prevent heart failure of hospitalizations and the statins therapy also recommended these patients and then uh, STL2 the, the drug we were discussing uh, in the last slide there are a few many options but in Sri Lanka we can uh, we have uh, empagliposine is widely available and even depagliposine so which are it's ex little expensive we can uh, 10 and 25 milligrams available i think 10 milligram one is around 70 and uh, again the 25 one may about 100 maybe 125 like but if affordable patients with having uh the, the, the their recommendations are in patients with diabetic at high risk of cv disease cardiovascular disease or with cv disease in order to prevent uh heart failure hospital then even they recommend the patients without heart failure as options to prevent or delay the hospitalization due to heart failure so it is a one of the options to prevent like primary prevention uh, so that those are the and the other thing is a usual our recommendation smoking and all so so i few things about the diabetes and heart failure uh insulin though it's a drug of choice for the control of sugar it usually retains some uh, sodium and water and need careful monitoring when you are giving especially high doses of uh, insulin for the heart failure patients even the long-term therapy you have to give adequate diuresis with the treatment and uh, metformin again you can continue but there shouldn't be a 
uh, renal impairment, you know GFR should be less than more than 30, or there shouldn't be hepatic impairments. And sulfonylureas, the common uh, effective treatment, like uh, we use uh, uh, glibenclamide, glimipride, but they are not recommended uh, when the patients, uh, they are not preferred treatment in patients with heart failure, that's what that they say, recommend guidelines say. And again, the gliptans, citagliptin, linagliptin, we are now commonly using in the patients. And they, they show there's no benefit. And so they do not recommend to reduce CV events in diabetic patients with heart failure. Uh, so that's the depend on the current evidences. So may, may come to the practice in the future. Uh, so uh, I mentioned some, I forgot to say something about digoxin. Uh, which is also a well-known drug in the heart failure as well as in arrhythmia treatment. Uh, they say heart uh, dejection may be considered in patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction in sinus rhythm to reduce the risk of hospitalization and as well as uh, patients with AF with rapid ventricular rate. The main that's a, uh, dejection mainly used to control the, uh, the rate of the atrial fibrillation. But uh, we usually don't do not go for the dejection uh, and we try for with the beta blockers mainly to control the rate because uh, difficult to control uh, monitor the dejection level because it has a very narrow therapeutic level where I, with the easily they can go into the toxic uh, uh, effects of the dejection so that may be detrimental uh, for the patients uh, with heart failure if we do not closely follow up so but still you can use and doesn't not have been shown any prognostic benefit so far. The ivabedine, uh, we were, I explained to you, and its action in the sinus node. And uh, but still, uh, they say every effort should be made to commence an uptight rate beta blockers therapy to guideline recommended maximally tolerated doses prior to considering ivabedine. So it's not a drug still uh, recommended in the first line. So they you can use, but still. You can try with the other drugs. So this this chart give you a good summary about the uh, management of the patient coming with the heart failure. Uh, other than the acute initial management, the all four drugs in the uh, green uh, blocks are the first line recommendations. Uh, just we talked about, and then uh, to treat the volume all or diuretics again, uh, uh, they mentioned in the second row. And in the third row, uh, about that uh, cardiac synchronization therapy, in the yellow cages are the drugs that uh, or, or options are not recommended as a first line. So that's what they have mentioned in the some different colors. Uh, we talk about the uh, dejection and CABG and a lot of other things, some value replacement. Uh, you are betting those are not. Uh, uh, little advanced treatment options when it come to the after the first uh, case uh, management steps so uh, this cage again i found little important uh, to identify some of the categories of heart failure patients uh, even they present with acute uh, presentation we can find these kind of patients in our etus uh, <laughs> They call uh, uh, dry and warm, dry and cold, wet, warm and wet, cold. The warm and cold mean peripheral perfusion. So whether the peripheries are warm or cold. So dry means the lungs are not that uh, heavy. That means not uh, no lung, no uh, absolutely no pulmonary edema, and they are warm in the peripheries, but they are still symptomatic. They have some component of heart failure, really, maybe mildly reduced ejection fraction or with preserved ejection fraction, but still not getting the adequate amount of uh, cardiac output. So they are tired, fatigue, and this kind of patients. So they need the oral therapy adjustments only. So then you can get some idea, the patients still, you can't go by just by seeing the ejection fraction of the heart, uh, echocardiogram. So you have to look into the other factors where, why these patients are complaining of fatigue, shortness of breath, tiredness. So there may be component of heart failure uh, with uh, with other combined uh, problems with the, the lungs 
uh, even anemia so those things also and sometimes thyroid toxic thyroid status and then dry and cold then you can see the lungs are not uh, much edematous but then peripheries are not perfused hypo perfusion and hypolemic so then you can consider fluid challenge consider inotropic agents if still hypothesis then you can treat with alone inotropic agents to see with some fluid challenge we can start initially give some fluid challenge and then with some inotropic drugs and uh, and treat the acute event maybe mild ischemic event maybe anemia while uh, uh, treating that part you can give some other supportive therapy and again that wet warm and wet cold again the wet mean again the pulmonary edema is there congestion uh, warm mean but still peripheries are perfused uh, like the, uh, our our patient who had a good perfusion but he, he had a pulmonary edema so then if the hyper, hypertension is there you can use vasodilators and diuretics as we uh, the our patient management was done in this category and uh, if the congestion is predominant like uh, rather than uh, hypertension the blood pressure is little low and but still the pulmonary edema as you pulmonary edema you can go for the diuresis vasodilators carefully the diuresis is number one then when the pressure is high vasodilators come to the number one treatment which reduces uh, Uh, symptoms and blood pressure both and uh, help to outcome good cardiac output and then congestion is predominant rather than blood pressure you can go for the diuresis fix di- plus and then vasodilators status because it will reduce the blood pressure and ultra filtration if not uh, improving and wet and cold mean the uh, congested and hyperperfus both is a difficult area when the systolic is less than 90 you have to go for the inotropes uh, vasopressors and uh, uh, maybe dop- dopamine and both uh, noradrenaline and then diuretics and mechanical support may need and when the blood pressure is more than 90 you uh, they prefer vasodilators and diuretics and then come to the in- inotropes if the not improving so this is a rough guidance to each case but gi- this gives a good uh, count of uh, brief but important account of management options cardiac uh, shock we discussed and the this again we have talked a lot about this also uh, right so this is so so i think now so this is like nice uh, graphic uh, demonstration of what happens the when the cardiac dysfunction is occurs this is actually this explain the pathophysiology uh what happens when the heart is not functioning is it become a dam and fluid accumulate beyond that level so there are the activation of endothelial is uh, what happened is uh, renal angiotensin system activated and then sympathetic nerve system activated and uh, uh, mainly an inflammation develops and uh, uh, arginine uh, arginine vasopressin system a uh, avp system also activated but i couldn't go for that much details about that but what we commonly see is the sympathetic nerve system activation what causes is the peripheral vasoconstriction so even the perfusion is the heart is adequately cardiac output maintained the patient may get the cold peripheries uh, and the, in the renal angiotensin uh, and losterone system activation may cause more water and sodium retention and the same time the endothelial dysfunction and inflammation occurs so all the many organs affected in this uh, system the pathophysiology of heart failure is not a simple uh, reduction in cardiac output and usually uh, uh, two things affect either fluid uh, retention fluid accumulation as well as fluid redistribution so those are the two things affecting but fluid accumulation is the mainly sodium and water retention in congestive cardiac failure that usually they say this is the manifestation of the chronic uh, uh, congestive cardiac failure coming with acute uh, exacerbation but when uh, fluid redistribution is stopped when they are coming the first time the patients having acute mi and going into pulmonary edema so then the, with the sympathetic overactivation 
the fluid redistribution means the peripheral shutdown and more fluid goes into the pulmonary area to maintain the good cardiac output. So that means they get the pulmonary edema, but there's no other means of uh, like you, you don't see sometimes JVP, abdominal distension, no uh, lower limb edema. So that's in the acute presentation. So those are the two uh, uh, pathophysiological mechanisms that we can see in heart failure. So at the same time, patient develop, the, we, we commonly see patients with heart, uh, heart failure have the renal impairment, at least temporary. So this is called cardiorenal syndrome. And, uh, and very nicely they explain this is not purely because of uh, reduced renal uh, perfusion. Even having good perfusion, good dejection fraction, cardiac output, but still when the heart is damaged, the kidney get impaired function uh, there's a nice there was a nice article saying that cross linkage of this organ function so that's why one organ shut down other organs also start shutting down because there are a lot of un unidentified hormonal connection contacts and their interregulation so those mechanisms causes impairment and the cardiohepatic syndrome again the same thing even without liver congestion you can see enzymes elevated sometimes albumin goes down and the bubble congestion very important fact because the chronic heart failure the chronic uh, congestion, uh, accumulation of fluid goes to, the, uh, makes the patients more anorexia, reduce intake and cachexia, we call cardiac cachexia, mainly seen in the right and then uh, left heart failure, then right heart failure and then patient get cachexia due to the, this edema in the bowels. So I think we have symptoms again. I think uh, no need to explain again uh, these things. Okay, we have done. So I think it's time to uh, stop the presentation and I must thank, uh, uh, sorry, <coughs> right, uh, I must thank uh, Himal and the, uh, Dr. Nandini for uh, coordinating this uh, with me and giving this opportunity and the SLC, uh, Dr. Ganaka and the team uh, and all participants uh, today. Also, uh, I thank for your uh, participation as well. So over to, over to Himal and to proceed uh, with uh, any other questions or anything if we can discuss now. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Lakmal, for your excellent explanation and uh, the, your practical approach to the heart failure. Without further delay, we'll go to the Q&A sessions. So uh, the first one, uh, but is there any uh, demarcation of time demarcation of acute versus chronic heart failure? Uh, it, it, it's not clearly mentioned. And uh, what uh, what they say is usually that uh, uh, acute heart failure usually presenting with the acute event. You uh, very uh, basically the patient coming with sudden onset onset chest pain and then uh, de developing heart failure on our admission or within short period of admission. So, but the chronic heart failure usually they are they are the decompensation of ongoing chronic uh, cardiac impairment. Maybe no known patient, maybe unknown. So they will come and say last week or the few days of symptoms like uh, autopnea, paroxysm, nocturnal dyspnea, some ankle edema and uh, loss of appetite. And then they admit at the verge of uh, overload. But the acute ones are coming a little early, but they don't uh, demarcate as such, but it's only mainly depending on the history and early uh, previous uh, evidence of uh, ongoing cardiac or other comorbidities. Right. Uh... There are some more definition uh, you should explain to the audience according yeah. to their questions. Uh, what is the difference between cardiogenic pulmonary edema and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Uh, right. So uh, the cardiogenic pulmonary edema is as what we were discussing here. And the, uh, the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we say it, it, it's a, uh, usually what we see is the uh, Flash pulmonary edema, which is usually associated with the renal impairment. But then, 
difficult to identify what is the initial stage. This is difficult to identify what is the cause, but then again need the proper the history and assessment to see uh, uh, whether it's any related to the cardiac or whether some other uh, the organ impairment is supported with this. Uh, so then again, that other uh, para, like especially that X-rays are important when uh, X-ray signs are there, especially for uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. As we know that upper lobe diversion, uh, that the bad pain signs, uh, B lines, and those things are and cardiomegaly. Usually we can see in the cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But when it comes to the uh, nephrogenic, which is class pulmonary edema, common one, but we don't see uh, those signs. And also renal impairment and long-term other kidney damage in the past, uh, which also will give other clues to the diagnosis. Then it's, uh, it's a clinical diagnosis and then we can do the appropriate management with that. All right. Uh, this is regarding the basic investigations, uh, investigations and the heart failure. Uh, what are the common ECG findings of heart failure and can the person present with heart failure with normal ECG? Yes, uh, usually uh, they say normal, normal ECG, usually you can have some changes, uh, but it's non-specific. Let's say, uh, usually you can see that in acute stage, acute heart failure, usually ST elevation or ST depressions. But when it comes to the uh, chronic heart failure with acute decompensation, you can see various kind of ECG changes, maybe T inversions and maybe uh, LVH changes with left, uh, we call hypertensive uh, heart disease, LVH, uh, short form left ventricular hypertrophy. So, uh, and some T uh, and ST changes. So those are, by seeing that, you can't say that this patient is having heart failure because that can be there for a long time in a patient, but then you can get a clue that patient has some cardiac involvement. That's what uh, we can say. Usually no normal ECG with heart failure. There should be some changes. Uh, regard, this is regarding biomarkers and cardiac failure. Is there any difference of values when we considering acute versus chronic heart failure? Uh, yes. <clears throat> the, especially if you, uh, actually the, the biomarker we discuss, the BNP is the one that uh, the specific biomarker that to uh, identify this acute and um, um, chronic changes because troponin also we get uh, reduced over the two weeks. So once you get it high, but then it uh, reduce after ischemia. But what happens in uh, BNP uh, levels in the body will remain if the heart failure is there, but in the acute heart failure, you get the very higher values. And with the chronic heart failure, you get the little uh, low values, uh, but pers permanent and persistent. Uh, so then uh, usually the, in, the, in the guidelines, what they say is biomarkers are important to come to uh, like uh, identify heart failure in, uh, as we saw in the, some of the algorithms to rule out maybe some neg good negative predictive value as uh, because they say the BNPs are high in many other conditions also, even renal impairment. And even we know troponin also getting little, little delayed to vanish from the circulation when there's a kidney impairment. And at the same time, biomarkers also not specific to the heart failure, but it can raise in many other conditions. But negative ones will rule out the uh, congestive cardiac failure. That's I think that's the most uh, important key uh, aspect of the using the biomarkers. Uh, what is the maximum dose of frosamide we can use in heart failure, especially this regarding the, regards to the patient with renal failure? Right. Uh, actually, that that was I, I could not specifically find the answer for this question. Uh, but the what they say is, as I mentioned, that what we practice is giving, giving more, more and more repeated and repeated frosamide in the patients with heart failure, but it's not effective. So you have to identify early when the your frosamide either 40 or 80, if not producing good urine. So you have to early decide this is going to uh, be a little resistant to the frosamide. I that's what guideline says. You they re do not recommend to give rep repeated boluses over the time. What they say is maximum 240 over 24 hours 
and then if not producing enough diuresis so there's a problem in the kidneys that not responding so maybe having kidney impairment may not so they don't ca categorically says with this uh, EGFR you don't give and you uh, but I think if the GFR is low the response may should be low so that's why the initial assessment also we should know the patient's creatine level and the, so if the kidneys are impaired and the rosemite is not working better to go at, at other drugs if the spinalactone or the spinalactone uh, or thiazide depending on the electrolytes and other levels to enhance the diuresis so I think that's the best approach rather than uh, there's no demarcation that uh, if kidney failure, this is the dose and otherwise this, but depending on the response. Uh, so next question also regarding the fusamide. Is there any difference of using infusions versus boluses? Yes. In fusamide in heart failure, at heart yeah. they, they, they mentioned uh, there's no difference. You can select either way. That's what they said. Uh, but what the matter is the uh, outcome. So if the if the boluses work on the patient, but what we usually do is when the patient comes to the uh, unit, ETU and heart failure, we give a bolus because that, that's like a loading dose. You give 40 or 80 and then prepare for other things. But while waiting for that during half an hour to one hour, if patients start producing clear urine, we can see very nicely to the catheter they start producing urine that means the prusamide working so in that kind of patients uh, you can uh, think of giving boluses which is uh, de depending on the facilities available and but if you see if you think the patient uh, is uh, full of edema and uh, better to have uh, infusions you can go for infusions and again maybe starting with the five milligram per hour or titrating up to 10 so then uh, again the uh, what we expect is to have the good urine output. The outcome is the same. If either way it produces urine, so you can use it, uh, use these two, maybe depending on the infusion number, infusion pumps available or the facility of monitoring and these things available, you can go for the infusion. But they say either thing, uh, in, uh, there's no much uh, significant difference between IV or the boluses. Right. Uh, this regarding uh, fluid and the heart failure. Uh, is there any instances we give the fluid in the heart failure, acute heart failure? And the next one under the fluids, uh, if it's so, how we approach the heart failure with the fluids? Right. This is, uh, again, a little uh, difficult question to answer. They, they, they ask, when usually we try not to give fluids in the acute heart failure patients. Uh, that's not specifically mentioned in the guidelines. I went through throughout the guideline. I doubt whether I miss something, but then they, they always say to uh, when the blood pressure is low, to give some uh, start with the inotropes and vasopressors. So rather than giving additional fluids. So uh, I actually I could not find to give a good answer for that question uh, at what what instance we should give fluid uh, because none of the uh, places uh, encourage us to give fluid in this situation so maybe what what usually what we in, in our practice what we do is when the patients have very low uh, like uh, output is uh, urine output and low blood pressure with iron tropes we used to give 100 milliliter boluses and we monitor the saturation maybe you go by when the pulmonary edema is treated with iv vasopressin uh, like nitrates and but when the blood pressure is low we have to vasodilate therapy plus we have to go for the uh, vasopressors like uh, iron tropes so then with, uh, with the balance of this Sometimes we suspect whether the intravascular volume is low. Even having pulmonary edema, their intercirculatory inter volume may be low. Then in that instance, sometimes it works by giving 100 milliliter fluid boluses, uh, little low boluses. Sometimes we give over half an hour. But unfortunately, I, I can't give you a straight uh, answer for that question because it's not mentioned in the uh, properly mentioned in the guidelines. They always go for the 
supportive treatment and they but they especially talk about the uh, hemofiltration rather than giving fluids so uh, in this scenario i am little uh, uh, that's what we do uh, basically but uh, that i want to find more detail about this uh, to give a correct answer that's a little bit doubtful area um right uh this is regarding the iantrop you have already discussed the iantropic support and the heart failure so what is will what will be the best iantrop is there any best iantrop you use or what is your preference preferable iantrop using when you have a heart failure with the low bp yeah low bp so they they prefer giving a uh, dopamine as iantrop but when they, they say blood pressure should be more than uh, 85 and some says 80 uh, as a first line uh, dopamine usually dopamine uh, doesn't cause much blood pressure pick up uh, because it gives a little balance with uh, peripheral vessel uh, with little vaso dilatation in peripheries but uh, uh, slight increase in contractility so it doesn't affect the cardiac uh, exhaustion much so that's the, that's why it's preferred so ultimately it doesn't cause much blood pressure rise but uh, then if the make making good urine output adequate urine output you can keep it even the blood pressure maintaining low maybe systolic about 90 uh, sometimes it picked up to 100 but then further lower in the blood pressure you have to go for the dopamine dopamine is the one Uh, that have little uh, uh, intrapic and chronotropic that means the heart rate also little goes up and contractility also goes up then it will pick up the blood pressure but then failing that is but they recommend is no noradrenaline no norepinephrine or noradrenaline but which has uh, uh, neither prognostic and even detrimental effect if the blood uh, heart is to have exert more and it will deteriorate the function so but at that stage usually their prognosis is not good so but anyway that is the option we have to go and even patient sometimes respond so that is the order in nine tropes to use in the uh, that's what mentioned in the guideline also right uh, this is regarding the drugs and the heart heart failure uh, there are certain drugs we can cannot be used in acute heart failure especially when we using in a patient with ischemic heart disease and chronic heart failure what are the those drugs right uh, <clears throat> the chronic heart acute heart failure especially uh, if we talk about the like targeted treatment which are but we we go for the uh, one one important drug with the long term benefit is the one one is the beta blocker uh, i think that's what they asking for Uh, as i mentioned beta blocker is a uh, good uh, uh, drug with a long term outcome but then uh, we should not go for the acute stage to control the heart rate where you have to little wait and see one, until the patients are little you e- volemic that, that means the overload is imp- improved and then you can start by lower dose and titrate that's that's the one thing and again the bp control also that when you use ac inhibitors you have to be little careful because that sometimes that some people it drastically drop the blood pressure uh, so then uh, that will impair the, the again output so then because it it has a vasodilator effect uh, we so we, there also we have to start on the small dose and grow, come up with the dose but you can use ac inhibitor before earlier than the beta blockers while other drugs are working and the when it goes to the chronic heart failure there are uh, but then chronic heart failure beta blockers is a must again you have to titrate the dose and the uh, frequency uh, you can use uh, like drugs like metoprolol bisoprolol and carbidolol which are available in our pharmacy in the hospital pharmacies as well so then the again you know how the carbid low start with 1.25 and go to 2.5 and 3.125 like very slowly you have to titrate the dose because even the chronic heart failure really get can get worse if you start with the high dose so the there are some other as we all know that steroids uh, nsaids for 
various pains and uh, aches and pains can worsen the heart failure even insulin they say can retain the fluid so uh, when you use insulin for the in heart failure patients with diabetic history of diabetes so you have to titrate the diuretics i think uh, that's the way to control the retention uh, one effect of the one drug you have to counteract by the other drugs likewise you have to give uh, so those are the the medication strictly related to the management as well as commonly associated with the these uh, what about calcium channel blockers yeah calcium channel blockers again you can use what about calcium channel blockers so oh, calcium channel blockers uh, is uh, the second drug when the beta blockers are failing you can you can uh, we go for the calcium channel blockers the common one is diltiazem which uh, does not have much uh, effect on the contractility like doing uh, uh, nifedipine like drugs we don't use here nifedip uh, veramil or the diltiazem or the veramil is a drug we use and especially diltiazem has some antiarrhythmic effect also so you use it as beta blockers mm, then again uh, this is also same theory applied when you use the use in uh, both uh, conditions either acute or a chronic so when the asthmatic patients comes you have to uh, give up beta blockers and go for the calcium channel blockers but the same theory apply and uh, slow slowly you have to use until you get the therapeutic effect uh, the last question heart failure and bradycardia uh, and the use of atropine for bradycardia in a heart failure yeah so uh, what we usually uh, do is when the uh, heart failure is uh, patients coming with bradycardia we give bolus of atropine and uh, that will temporarily uh, improve the condition uh, but sometimes when uh, repeated atropines we, we sometimes give boluses 1 bolus 0.6 and then increase the double the dose and give but when uh, one while two while if the bad, sometimes it doesn't respond uh, but with some people it respond but then you have to take the ecg and see what's going on the actually atropine is a temporary measurement until the we get the permanent uh, diagnosis and treatment so the recently what, what we uh, we got one patient patient uh, came with pulse rate of 34 and 5 like and uh, uh, because of this low blood uh, heart rate we gave atropine one mile and it picked up to 50s and uh, we got ecg we found that patient uh, in complete heart block and very quickly again go back to the uh, uh, bradycardia and we had to give another bolus but we didn't much respond so what we did was we uh, ex- we put the external pacing in our etu and patient uh, uh, transfer to thk because that kind of patients need the pacemaker so atropine is a actually a short term uh, drug that we can bypass until we get a time to get a uh, permanent solution or so sometimes isoprenoline infusion may be helpful if the atropine is not working uh, but we don't give repeatedly much atropine or we don't go for the infusions atropine in heart failure to my knowledge so it's a, only a drug that to, till we get some uh, other measurement to bypass the time right uh, that will be all in the q and a session i would like to thank dr lakmal vitanage consultant physician at ph uh, sudukama for joining us over the from all over from gaul in this difficult time even with the connection issues and uh, thank you dr lakmal for joining us and regarding a very informative lecture and i would like to thank sri lankan college of internal medicine and its president dr ganaka senaratn as well as a call Uh, Dr. Uh, Nandini Nyanafaka, who is coordinating from the college on these lecture sessions, and I would like to thank all audience who was joining us in the even with the difficult connection issues and other issues in the country. Uh, and uh, without further ado or delay, I would like to hand over the concluding remarks to Dr. Sachin. Sachin, Sachin, over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Himal. Uh, as you said, even though 
all of us are having a uh, having very difficult situation with power failures and low signal uh, we noticed a good participation uh, even for today's cpd uh, so this uh, session will be uh, available to you on sri gmo knowledge academy youtube channel in few days uh, then you can uh, cover up your gaps uh, or if you had any interruptions during the session uh, the link to e uh, e certificate for participation has been sent to the chat box you can fill it up it now and uh, i thank dr lakshmal vitanage consultant physician at base hospital udugam uh, for allocating your precious time even though uh, you also are, uh, you also having a uh, very uh, disrupted situation and finally i thank all participation all participants uh for joining uh, with us today and for dr himal and shri team uh, for organizing the cpd program without any discontinuation thank you all thank you